So here we're going to talk about module three, which is communities, bios, and ecosystems, but we're doing lesson one, which is aquatic ecosystems. So everything um, that has to do with the water on earth. So first we're going to talk about um, kind of how water gets divided up on earth. So you have freshwater ecosystems, which is the first topic we're going to cover. And that includes ponds, lakes, streams, rivers, wetlands, and the plants and the animals in freshwater ecosystems are adapted to low salt content in freshwater, meaning there is little to no salt in the water. And freshwater only accounts for 2.5% of the water on earth. So if we look at this graph over here on the left, this is all of the water on earth. Only 2.5% of it is freshwater. The other 97.5% of that is salt water. And many organisms, including humans, cannot consume salt water and survive. Um, but there are a lot of organisms that do live in the salt water. And so we'll get to those ones later. But for now, let's focus on the freshwater. So of all the freshwater on Earth, 68.9% of the freshwater on Earth is found in glaciers. And so... Most of the fresh water on Earth is found in glaciers, and glaciers are critical um, in erosion and weathering, and they play a big, big, big role in regulating the climates on Earth and the ocean currents also. And then 30.8% of fresh water is in groundwater, and groundwater can be used in irrigation or in wells, um, but there are not a lot of species that use groundwater or live in groundwater. And then only 0.3% of the freshwater is found in lakes and rivers. So really only 0.3% of the freshwater becomes usable really for us. Um, and that means that most of the organisms that live in freshwater only live in 0.3% of it. Um, so this means that most freshwater species are found in less than one one hundredth of a percent of Earth's water if we were to take all of the water. So one freshwater ecosystem is rivers and streams. So starting at the source, also called the headwater. So in this picture, this would be the source of the river or the stream. This is called the headwater. Water flows in one direction. So water is flowing in one direction down that mountain until it reaches the mouth, here is the mouth right here, um, which is where the water empties into a larger body of water, um, which could be a lake or an ocean. The source of the water, um, so where the headwater is coming from, so right here, this source or the headwater could be an underground spring or it could be snow melt, it just depends. And sediment is material that's picked up and redeposited by water. So. As the water travels downhill, different rocks and minerals and sand and silt are all going to get picked up and they can get carried down and deposited in different areas of the river. And um, the interactions between wind, land, and water will determine the amount of sediment moved. So if the, um, if the water is moving very quickly or the land is very sh uh, sharp, it will move more sediment. Um, the speed of the water erosion of the land, and the changing path of water. So again, so the interactions between the wind, land, and water will determine the speed of the water, the erosion of the land, and the changing path of water. So there's a lot of factors that come into rivers and streams, and they can alter if you change the wind or the land or even the water. And then we have uh, lakes and ponds. So lakes and ponds are both inland bodies of standing water where lakes exist all the time and are there for many, many years, whereas ponds can kind of appear and disappear as the seasons change. And during winter, most of the water on a lake or pond is the same temperature. Um, the, during the winter, the temperatures will be much colder. And then during the summer, the warmer less dense water is at the top and the colder, more dense water is going to be at the bottom of the lake or the pond. And you will see turnover. Um, and turnover is something that occurs in the spring and the fall. So when the temperatures are changing, so when you're going from either um, summer to winter or winter to summer. 
And uh, the when you're going from uh, summer, oops, yeah, summer to winter, you will have fall turnover. And what that means is that the warm water that was at the top, so this was warm and this was cold, now it starts to mix. And that mixing circulates nutrients and oxygen. And then in the uh, winter, most of the lake is going to be pretty cold. And then in the spring, once that ice layer melts, you'll get that circulation again. And then um, that'll again circulate nutrients and oxygen. So, um, so that turnover happens in the fall and in the spring. And then there's two kind of, you can categorize lakes into kind of two, um, two categories. So oligotrophic lakes are nutrient poor lakes. Those are found in the mountains and they cannot support a lot of plant or animal species. And so these ones, um, as you can see, there's, it, the water tends to be very clear because not a lot of species can live in it. There's not a lot of bacteria. There's not a lot of algae because, um, not a lot of species can live in those lakes. And a big reason for that is there's not as much oxygen. As you increase in altitude or elevation, there be there's less oxygen in the air, meaning there's less oxygen in the water. And because of that, not as many species can live here. So it is nutrient poor, not as much oxygen, and um, so it doesn't have a lot of plant or animals living in it. And those are going to be found high in the mountains. Whereas if you go lower in elevation, um, these lakes are called eutrophic. So eutrophic lakes are nutrient rich. They have lots of plants and animal species in them. And um, sometimes they'll be, they'll be like overloaded with nutrients. And um, that's when you can get these like what are called algae blooms. So this lake has a currently it ha is going through an algae bloom. And that's when you get so much nutrients from runoff like um, Fertilizers from farms um, can run off into lakes and get all this nutrients in the water, which causes so much algae to grow. Um, and so that's a eutrophic lake, much more nutrient rich. They get a lot of runoff from agriculture, which contributes to the amount of nutrient, nutrients that they have. And then when we're talking about lakes and ponds, they're divided into three different zones based on the amount of sunlight that they get. So the... Um, so the littoral zone is the closest to shore where the sunlight reaches the bottom. So that's going to be, um, I will outline this one in red. So that's going to be basically this area here. Um, and that contains a lot of producers like plants and algae. And um, there's going to be a lot of photosynthesis happening in that area. And then the Lemenic zone is the open water area that is very well lit. So we'll do this one in blue. And that's domina dominated by plankton. And plankton are little free-floating um, autotrophs and heterotrophs. They're both. And they can live in freshwater or in um, saltwater. And then the profundal zone is below the lemenic zone. And that is where there is minimal or no sunlight. And so we'll do this one in green. And so that's going to be kind of down here where there is way less sunlight. And it's going to be colder, um, less oxygen available. And so not as many species are going to live down at the bottom there. So now we're going to talk about marine ecosystems. And marine ecosystems are the oceans. Um, so the salt water. So marine ecosystems have a huge impact on the planet. Um, and through photosynthesis, marine, al marine algae consume carbon dioxide from the environment. I just realized there is a little typo here. This is supposed to say environment. And they produce over 50% of the oxygen that's found in the atmosphere. So that's a lot of oxygen. So 50% of the oxygen found in the atmosphere comes from algae from marine ecosystems. And then majority of precipitation comes from evaporation from ocean. So that so what that means is that majority of the evaporation that's happening on Earth is coming from the oceans. And 
when things evaporate, they eventually will precipitate. So meaning majority of the precipitation um, that we see comes from the ocean water. And marine ecosystems have several zones. So there's the intertidal zone. So intertidal zone is a narrow band where the ocean meets the land. And I'm sure you guys have heard of high tides and low tides, and that's the changing in the water level of an ocean. And area or organisms in this area must be adapted to constant change of daily tides. And um, there are four different zones of the intertidal zone. So you have the low tide zone, which is here, and that's when the water is going to be very low. You have the mid tide zone, so that's when the water starts to raise a little bit. And then you have high tide zone, which is the highest um, that the water will get. And then you have the spray zone, and that's basically where water gets splashed up. And so um, depending on where the moon is, the moon is what affects our tides. And, um, and so depending on where the moon is and the time of the day will determine the tides. And then the organisms that live here must be adapted to survive outside of water for a long time and also must be adapted to survive underwater for a long time. And just like lakes and ponds, the um, there are more zones to the marine ecosystem. So you have the photic zone. So um, that is where sunlight is able to penetrate. So that's going to be um, this area right here where sunlight is able to penetrate. Then you have the aphotic zone, which is where no sunlight is able to penetrate. And then you have the abyssal zone, which is anything that's going to be deeper than 4,000 meters. So that's going to be way at the bottom. This is still aphotic, by the way, um, but there's, you know, it's, it has its own little category called the abyssal zone. Um, so, you know, you can think of that when people say, oh, it's in the abyss. So like it's in the dark, blank, empty, um, because there's not a lot of things that live down here because it is so deep. And then the benthic zone is basically just the area right along the ocean floor. And in marine ecosystems, you have coastal ocean and coral reefs. And coral reefs tend to be found near the coast. And those are among the most diverse ecosystems. Um, only tropical rainforests and one other ecosystem is more diverse than these. But these are the most diverse of the aquatic ecosystems. And these occur in warm, shallow marine waters. And the coral reef supports more species per unit area than any other marine environment, including about 4,000 species of fish. So the coral reefs are very, very, very diverse. And coral reefs um, contain corals, and corals are what build our coral reefs. Uh, corals are soft body organisms that live in hard stone-like structures. So corals actually produce these structures. So um, this right here would be a picture of the coral, though this orange and yellow thing is the coral. So that's the soft bodied organism. And then they can produce these hard stone-like structures that they actually live in. And as the corals continue to live and continue to grow, um, they will build more and more um, stone-like structures and continue to build these coral reefs. And I'm sure that you've heard about the um, how coral reefs are dying off, and that can be due to kind of a few things. So corals have a symbiotic relationship with an algae, um, and... The algae are what provide color for a lot of coral. Um, and coral bleaching can occur when changes in the environment. It's like increased temperature kill that algae. So this algae lives on the coral. And as the temperatures increase, the algae can no longer survive. And therefore, the corals become all white, um, also known as coral bleaching. Coral bleaching. And then also... Um, as CO2 increases, so we know that um, climate change, a big factor in that is increase in CO2. And so as um, atmospheric carbon dioxide or CO2 increases, the water then absorbs that carbon dioxide. Um, and remember, we kind of talked about this when we talked about those um, 
those cycles in the environment. Carbon dioxide was one of them. So water can absorb carbon dioxide um, and that ends up decreasing the water or making it more acidic, which then also can kill the corals. So there's kind of two factors, temperature and then carbon dioxide, which can start to kill off our coral reefs. And then lastly, we have transitional aquatic ecosystems. And those are aquatic environments that, that are a combination of two or more environments. So either where land and water meet or where freshwater and saltwater meet. So a wetland is the area of land like marshes, swamps, or bogs that are saturated with water and support aquatic life. A lot of species can live in these wetlands. Um, different species of fish, different a lot of different species of birds, different species of plants. So a wetland is basically where um, a very widespread aquatic um, area that is on land. And then we have an estuary, and an estuary is an ecosystem where freshwater meets saltwater. So freshwater from a river or a stream meets saltwater from uh, the ocean. And this is one of the most diverse ecosystems um, just below the tropical rainforest and the coral reefs. So estuaries, because it's this mix of freshwater and saltwater, um, you can have a lot of organisms that live in this area.